All right, um, so today we're going to talk about podiatric medicine, if you didn't already know. And uh, I'm Diksha, and Yana, you want to introduce yourself. Hi, everybody. Uh, hopefully you guys can hear me. Uh, my name is Yona. I'm a third year podiatric medical student at CSPM, and I'm also a graduate from UCR, University of California, Riverside, and I graduated in biology. Yeah, and uh, I'm Diksha, and I'm also a third year podiatric medical student at CSPM, and I graduated from UC Davis with a neurobiology, physiology, and behavior uh, degree, and it's Probably if you are familiar with UC Davis, it's a very common <laughs> degree to have. It's kind of a joke because uh, we all love neurobiology. I don't know, something about it. Okay. So what is a podiatrist? Podiatrist is a physician or a surgeon who treats a foot and ankle and related structures of the lower extremities. What do podiatric physicians do? Podiatrists treat a wide variety of symptoms and conditions that patients have. So the patients they treat can range from pediatrics to geriatrics and athletes to diabetic patients. Podiatrists see a wide variety of patients every day. We can provide immediate relief to patients for their pain or discomfort. And we build rapport with the patients, something I especially love about the field. Uh, because we treat the same patient often from diagnosis, through treatment, surgery, and recovery. So many podiatrists enjoy a healthy work-life balance, working about 40 to 60 hours in one week and earning just as much as their other physicians, uh, physician peers, people in other specialties. So what are specific cases that we see? We see bunions, uh, people come to us with foot pain. Of course, there's nail care. And by that, we mean something that's related to someone's health. Suppose uh, a patient is, a patient can't reach their nails, or uh, if they do happen to cut their nails, it, they could nick themselves in a manner that could affect them. They could start bleeding profusely, things like that. Um, ulcers, or wounds, fractures, and nerve-related conditions, that's another, these are all very common conditions that we see. So podiatrists can pursue surgery, sports medicine, dermatology, pediatrics, wound care, diabetic care, forensics, and more. So we can literally treat all specialties even in the same day. And we often see that as students that are rotating through clinics at this time as well. We can also work in private practice, hospitals, emergency room, emergent trauma care facilities, sports teams, VA hospitals. And we often work with other medical professionals such as orthopedics, orthopedic surgeons, or family physicians, uh, anesthesi or, sorry, not anesthesiologists, uh, vascular surgeons. So these are all very common us. Um, oh, and just a quick little side note. We often, or at least I kind of made this up, but I like that because we kind of envelop all, all different subspecialties or just little subjects in podiatry. I like to call us the general physicians of the foot and ankle because we literally touch on everything when we're treating the foot and ankle. All right, Iona. Okay, um, so for education and training. So we go through four years in medical school. Uh, the first two years are didactic training where you take your basic science classes that you probably took in college, your biochemistry, your physiology, your histology, your immunology, microbiology. There's a lot of courses that you're gonna probably retake or you're gonna take for the first time. And within those two years, you also take additional lower extremity specific courses, such as biomechanics, podiatric medicine, podiatric trauma, podiatric surgery. So there's this additional training that goes into uh, training for being a podiatrist. And then typically your third year of medical school, you rotate for clinical training. You have clinical rotations around your local area. And these include different hospitals that you rotate 
rotate through and you just work with different doctors, different attendings and rotate with students. And you just do a lot of hands-on training, a lot of clinical work. And then for your fourth year, you have one year of externships, which essentially you go to different residency programs and you extern with them for one month where you see how you like the program, if it fits in with you. And then it's basically sort of them getting to know you as well and seeing if you fit in for that program for the next three years. So after you're done with one year of externships and you did all your boards, you have three years of surgical base residency. And I emphasize surgical base because all podiatrists are surgeons at the end of the day. So we have to go through three years of surgical base residency. And then afterwards you do, you can do optionally a one to two year of fellowship on something you could specialize in such as biomechanics, forefoot trauma, rear foot uh, reconstructive surgery. And there's a whole list that you can find on uh, the ACFAST website. And I also wanted to add, uh, I don't know if you said this, Yona, but <clears throat> during our rotations, this is it's like this in all medical schools, whether it's osteopathic, allopathic, or podiatric, we have certain rotations that we all have to do. So uh, the only ones that you might not see in some programs for podiatric are uh, OBGYN or psych rotations. But otherwise, there are a lot of, actually a lot of podiatric programs that we've spoken to that do have those rotations as well. But there are all, these are specific core rotations that everyone has to do. So if you're wondering, do you only do podiatry rotations? No, we also have to be trained in everything because at the end of the day, we are still physicians. <clears throat> okay, so for the applications, um, applications are accepted on a rolling basis starting in August for fall admission the next year. The application deadline is usually June 30th of each year for the fall admission of the same year. Uh, the earlier you submit, the better your chances of being accepted and also of being considered for merit-based scholarships and 99% of podiatry students after graduating are ultimately placed in a residency program. So these are two, there's two things I would like to highlight here. So again, the rolling basis, I would say definitely submit earlier because again, you want to be considered for that merit-based merit scholarship. Um, it's, it's, a, it's, it's really nice because a lot of programs do offer this and um, you don't have to have the highest uh, stats for this, the highest GPA, the highest MCAT scores. If you're within a bracket range for that merit-based scholarship, you can easily get, let's say, $5,000 uh, just given to you, and that could be renewed every year uh, in medical school. And again, you, submitting earlier increases your chances uh, based off the rolling basis. And then it's just really nice to see that 99% of podiatry students are ultimately ultimately placed in a residency program because we do have a surplus of residency programs everywhere around the nation. So that's really good. And you can see so many different programs and you just have a lot of options for you. So looking at the general requirements here. So the average MCAT score is around a 500. Average cumulative GPA is around a 3.3. Average science GPA is around a 3.2. And then for your science courses, you have to take biology, chemistry, organic chemistry, physics, so all your prerequisites as a pre-med, and then getting letters of recommendation. This is important because I think eight out of the nine podiatric medical schools now require you to get a letter of recommendation from a podiatrist. So that really forces you to actually shadow one and see if this field is the right fit for you. So that's really important to highlight here. And then as well as having a personal interview and then on the bottom, it says the science courses you take should be, the, be those designed for pre-medical students and must include laboratory experience. Courses for non-science majors in place of the courses for science majors are, not, are normally not accepted. Um, I just want to highlight some things here as well. Yes, the requirements to the average MCAT, the average GPA, um, it's, it might be in the little on the lower side compared to your typical MDD or RAP. 
But make, make no mistake, this is medical school. This is very difficult. We do take a lot of the same courses as the traditional MDDO students, in addition to taking those lower extremity classes. So I don't want you guys to think that these numbers are really easy to get into. It's, don't underestimate it. It's really hard. It's a really rigorous program. Oh, wait, so, sorry, Yona. Yeah. Uh, before, before you go on, I wanted to add on to what you were saying, because that was a great point. We also want to emphasize that <clears throat> as, as you go through college, so I believe some of you are, might, are in high school, or a lot of you are, um, you just have to kind of keep in mind that you, you should do your best to not only achieve a good like good grades and get your extracurriculars in, but also make sure that you're really understanding your material because like Yona said, you don't want to be that person who's assuming, okay, um, I'm going to pursue a specific degree because it's the easier degree just because the stats are lower because that's often the problem when um, if students do that, then they might not make it through because they didn't try that hard through college or they're expecting not to try so hard. Um, just remember that you should always put, I, and I don't think you guys need to hear this. If you're here, you're obviously a hard worker and um, you're doing great, but just uh, always, always remember that if you're going into any healthcare profession, you definitely it, it will be rigorous. That's that's just how it is because you have to know a lot. You're try you're basically saving a patient's life. Um, okay, your turn, Yona. <clears throat> so for there are nine podiatric medical schools. So there's not many, um, but there's actually one opening up in Texas pretty soon. So that's really exciting. So there's going to be ten. Um, ju just listing them out here. There's one in Arizona, Arizona School of Podiatric Medicine, Midwestern, uh, Barry University, which is located in Florida, Florida, uh, CSPM, California School of Podiatric Medicine, where we, where we are, it's in Oakland, uh, Des Moines University, which is in Iowa, Ken, Ken, or Kent State, which is in Ohio, New York College of Podiatric Medicine, New York Shoal College of Podiatric Medicine, which is in Chicago, Temple is in Philadelphia, and then Western is in SoCal uh, around the Pomona area. Okay, so why podiatry? Why do you wanna be in this profession? Why is this profession so enticing for people to wanna join this profession? So the first point, all podi podiatric medical students are trained as surgeons from day one through our curriculum and, and by being required to complete a three-year surgical re residency upon graduation from podiatric medical school. I know a lot of you, or maybe some of you are thinking about being surgeons one day, and you are thinking that, oh, if I go the typical MDDO route, I don't know if I'm going to be a surgeon. I don't know if I'm going to be placed into a residency program or whatever program I'm going to be placed in to be a surgeon. However, with being a podiatrist or going through podiatric medical school, we are automatically trained as surgeons. That doesn't mean you're forced to do surgery your whole career. Some people just go through that surgical based residency and then just stick to doing clinical care or doing biomechanics or working with sports teams. Uh, second point here, it's stress free. Again, like Diksha mentioned before, we work 40 to 60 hours per week. We usually work from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. And typically we're not on call. And it's a very and we have a great work-life balance, which brings me to point number three and the not on call thing. Because I know maybe some of you want to have a good family life and work-life balance is really important in your career or in your life. So you can get the best of both worlds with being a podiatrist. That doesn't mean you are automatically, automatically not on call. You can choose to be on call. You can choose to work those trauma cases late at night where they call you and you have to come in at 3 a.m. in the morning. You could do that as well. So there's this nice balance that you kind of have of both life, lifestyles. Um, seeing positive results fast. So again, we like to advocate for conservative treatment and that's what makes us a little bit different from the orthopedic surgeons. 
um, in their name, it's the orthopedics. They do a lot of surgery versus us. We could do surgery, but we'd like to do more of the conservative route, hands-on training, uh, hands-on training to make sure the patient gets better without going through that drastic route of doing surgery because there could be a lot of complications with surgery. Um, developing personal relationships. Uh, again, we, we, a lot of our patients are diabetic patients and we see them for long-term uh, cases and we're always learning more and more and more about their life. So we develop this really deep personal relationship with them. Uh, the ability to specialize in subspecialties. This is important, right? So again, after your surgical base or after or during your residency and after residency, you can start to specialize in things like forefoot trauma or rear foot trauma or biomechanics or sports medicine. And this is the nice thing about podiatry. You have so many things you can, it, it, you can branch out into so many different subspecialty fields that it has to offer. And then ultimately at the end of the day, you are a physician. Nobody can take that away from us. We are doctors, doctors of podiatric medicine, DPM. So you don't go through four years of medical school, three years of surgical base residency and one to two years of uh, optional fellowship training. So I just want you guys to keep that in mind. So if you have any questions, start shooting them out right now or put them in the chat. We would like to hear from you guys. And also just for our social media right here, we are on Instagram at the podiatry journey. You could also email us at the dpmjourney at gmail.com. And we also have a YouTube channel, The Podiatry Journey, where we have numerous videos uh, about just podiatry in general, about the different schools, and about our lifestyle. And don't be shy to ask any questions, guys. Yeah, we've, uh, we've definitely had a lot of people ask us even questions about the MCAT. So you can literally ask us anything. We know how confusing the journey can be through medicine. So don't be afraid. <clears throat> um, I think we have a few questions in the chat. Um, one of the questions good. are, um, this is a general question, but do medical schools accept pre-med course requirements, which were met at community colleges in addition to AP credit? I can repeat the That's, question. If you... No, 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 I, I, I completely understand the question. Um, I actually, that's a good question. I, we've never gotten that, asked that question. I actually don't know. I could get back to you about that question. Um, yeah, I would. Uh, <sighs> As far as I remember back, again, I was pre-med a long time ago, I guess, technically. <laughs> now, I hate to think of it like that, but it's true. Um, so from my time, it wasn't, it wasn't seen as a very good thing to, or not, I don't think it was even possible to use your AP credits for, uh, for pre-med requirements because med schools really wanted to see that you took those courses and you could handle it in college. Because as, as much AP courses are hard, not going to lie, um, I still have nightmares about them, but college courses are still different at the end of the day. As far as community college courses go, I do know people who did that and it was fine, but I know there is, this, there is kind of a stigma against that as well. Um, I fell into that trap and believed the stigma, but to be honest, if I could go back, I would have taken some, um, I would have taken some pre-med courses at a community college because um, at community colleges, as if some of you know, they put more effort into teaching it. They just have more time to teach you and there's less students. So sometimes, or from my experience, I've seen that it's, kind of better almost for me, uh, learning for learning and really understanding material. Um, um, so just thinking about more of the question now. Um, so for community colleges, I, so if you take a course at a community college, it can't, it is allowed for certain schools, I believe, to that carry over into your transcript and be accepted for medical school. 
I don't think AP credit counts as much. I unless the school, the college you're looking at looks at your AP credit and it's like, okay, because you did this for let's say biology, you can skip uh, the first semester for that biology course your first year of college. So technically that could count that way. Um, so that's just my thought process behind that question, but I could get more info um, about that and send it to you. Okay, awesome, thank you. Our next question is, uh, what has been your favorite part of your podiatric medical journey so far? Um, my favorite part, <sighs> there's a lot of favorite parts. Um, favorite part would probably be just the clinical exposure um, and working with patients. I love, especially now with COVID where I, where you don't see a lot of your classmates because classes are not happening in person. Uh, just being able to go to clinic and seeing just patients and talking to them and just helping them out and just doing hands-on training, feeling like you're a doctor. You're not a doctor, but you're, you're training to be a doctor and just uh, helping them out, make their lives a little bit better and then thanking you. I think that's one of the most gratifying experiences that I have almost every day. And I'm just blessed to be doing what I do. So this is, that's my favorite part so far through my medical school journey. Yeah, also, uh, I just uh, did a quick search um, about the AP credit question, just to make sure. So there are very, there are a few medical schools that accept the AP credits, but I would advise against that for uh, pre for prerequisites. For other things, general ed, go ahead and use your AP credits for that. But uh, which I know there aren't that many, but there are some courses you could skip with that. But as far as AP credits for pre-med requirements, I, I would take that course. Um, but again, ask your advisor at your school for what they believe is right, but most med schools don't accept it. Um, yeah, okay. So um, so what my favorite experiences so far is, like Yona was saying, my favorite part is feeling like a doctor when you're in medical school and all you're doing is sticking your heads in the books and it's kind of what you spent all of college doing as well. Uh, so it feels really, really great when we learn specific skills like doing injections or helping uh, when we're in when we were at a surgery rotation, honestly being side by side with the surgeon and you know, being able to suture, which is lots of fun, or just seeing organs that are live. Because yes, we practice on cadavers, but it's a, a human body that's alive is so totally different. It's really fascinating. Um, yeah, getting to see patients and helping them out, whether it's working on their wounds or helping diagnose uh, it's just a totally different feeling, especially when you get the diagnosis or treatment correct. <laughs> awesome, thank you guys. Um, our next question is, how difficult is the interview process? Difficult, um, how difficult is it? Very difficult, so difficult. Should make you cry. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm joking. Um, Difficult. I, I think this really is a subjective question. I think it just really depends on um, my screen just, okay. It just depends a little bit on the questions and how you respond to those questions and your just emotion, your overall emotion that day when you're going to these interviews. I like to tell all prospective students who are entering their, inter their interviews or preparing for their interviews to just stay relaxed. and. I know that's a very cliche thing to say to students, but it, it's it's the truth. Stay relaxed, don't have too much anxiety go into it. And also just know your resume inside and out. Be prepared for them to ask you questions about that. Be prepared to answer why podiatry, because that's all ultimately the 
million dollar question that they're going to ask you and that's what you're writing your personal statement on so be prepared to answer those questions be flexible and again just less anxiety the better because uh, these interview processes i know for myself personally uh, at cspm uh, the person who was interviewing me asked me really nice questions and he asked me about why i was part of the cooking club and uh, what foods i enjoyed cooking and so it made my whole overall experience in the interview really fun and i was like laughing during the interview process with the admissions officer so i again it's again it's all subjective i i that's all i can say right now and just if you if you're nervous about it that's fine but just make sure you know you've done your research from the school you've got you made sure you know your resume really well and just be prepared to answer questions that are very obvious about podiatry and why podiatry yes exactly you want to be able to it, it is subjective but from most of the people i've spoken to they would agree that a lot of the interviews honestly if you were already chosen for an interview just remember, I know no matter what we say right now, you're going to have, you're going to be nervous. You're going to be a little anxious about it and that's okay. Uh, I can't tell you otherwise. And that's good. That's healthy. So make sure you are a little nervous because that way you will at least perform well. But a lot of it is also, they want to see your personality at this point. They want to see if you are in fact a real person. <laughs> um, and yeah, know your application really well because they could pick anything out of your application. Don't put things, uh, I mean, if you want to add something in your application that you, that you don't have a lot to say about, at least remember that you did in fact put that in your application so that when they eventually do ask you about it, you have enough to say. Uh, that's something I'd really mention. And then shadow enough so that you have enough to say about podiatry and why you chose podiatry over anything else. That's big. Thank you. Um, my next question is, how is it to study in Oakland and uh, what is the environment in the school? You know, oh, um how is it to study in Oakland? So there's different parts of Oakland. It's a very big city. And depending on where you live, there's probably a local library that you can go to that you could study at. Um, I know for our school, we have a library as well. It's um, open to the general public, but the library itself is really nice because you could do, you could reserve rooms for yourself. With, you could do group study rooms, you could do single study rooms. And um, the learning environment there is great. It's very quiet. Uh, nobody's really disturbing. Even though it's open to the public, it's no one's really doing anything um, loud or noisy in there. It's, it's, it's a great study environment overall. And again, our campus is, I would say, is a pretty decent sized campus. So there are actually a lot of areas within our campus that you could find besides the library to study at, which is, which is incredible because your first two years, you're going to be studying your butt off and you want to find these different spots and you probably want to change the change of environment. I know probably many of you who are studying, you can't sit at your desk all day, 24 seven, looking at your screen. You need to, you just need a change, right? So that's how I was in medical school. And that's how I was in college and high school. So uh, just having these different changes of sceneries are really nice. And yeah, and California is a beautiful state. So the weather here is, is pretty nice to begin with. So studying outside is, is not a problem at all. You won't have to be dealing with snow or rain too often. And yeah, that's, that's pretty much what I have to say. Well, for studying, for me, the reason why I love Oakland uh, before COVID, of course, was that there are just so many, there's so many cafes. And I loved that because I wasn't, I didn't want to be around my classmates as much. I get, I get a little nervous. So my, my thing was always going to the local, not even local, just anyway, there's so many cafe shops, like I said, buyer school. Uh, even if I wanted to drive near 
was closer to my apartment, which is which was in Oakland at the time, I would just study at a cafe by me and I would get some steps in to walk over there. And it's it's was great, honestly, because I'm someone who needs that variety. So yeah, and then Oakland, like Yona said, there's always something to do as well. So if you need that break, uh, you have, you easily have access to events everywhere and they're incredible restaurants. <clears throat> and San Francisco is right there as well. So it's wonderful. Uh, okay, and our next question is, was it ever difficult to stay motivated? If so, how did you persevere? Um, so it is very difficult to stay motivated. I personally don't like studying biochemistry and histology, sometimes human anatomy, because you just, you would think to yourself that after college, the GPA scale will go away. You don't have to try too hard for your classes. You just have to study them and love them and enjoy them and apply them to clinic. But yeah, sometimes it, it got di difficult, you know, that you're going to find yourself having three midterms in one week. And you're just like, how am I supposed to get all this information in my head? Is this even possible? How do even students do this? And the truth of the matter is that not everyone's perfect, right? And you will not, you will have to accept and you have to swallow a hard pill that you can't memorize everything. You just can't. It's that's just the way it is. If you can, good for you. You're you're a prodigy and you have this God-given gift and talent. But um, you just have to take the punches and understand there's only so much you can do, so much you can study, and you can only you can only do your best in certain exams and you want to try to avoid that avoid that burnout because burnout is real it happens to a lot of us it's happened to me plenty of times and it really does just affect your mood and affect your studying game and it affects you for other classes so you need to find this nice work-life balance and that's important for staying motivated because if you don't have a good at least social life in addition to your academic life Again, you're going to find burnout to be a real thing for you on a daily basis. And for me personally, I would just on Saturdays, I would de-stress by not actually doing much work at all, actually. And I would go out with Diksha and some of my friends and we'll go to Oakland or San Francisco and we'll just walk and visit different areas, go to different restaurants, go out at night because that type of just laid back lifestyle a little bit and just de-stress from everything and give yourself a break is important. And it's important for your health, especially. And that is what allowed me to at least reset before having to go back into studying more and more information again for that upcoming week. So you need to have that reset. Also a big motivational tool for me was just the idea that medical school is not cheap and your parents or whoever if you're taking out loans or something it's you need to understand there's a lot of money that you're putting into this and it's you need to understand that you want to study as best as you can to make sure that your investment into yourself is worth it or at least your parents investment because you don't want to disappoint yourself you don't want to disappoint your parents and that was one of the key things that was also motivating me and helping me persevere through my classes. And just a daily reminder of what I'm doing is to please myself, please my parents, but also help patients one day to be the best doctor I can be. So that's my two cents on that question. Yeah, my, <clears throat> my motivation uh, honestly, when you first start medical school, you're going to have a, a lot of motivation, right? The only way to maintain it is doing what Yona was saying, make sure you have self-care breaks. And I would recommend that regardless of where you are in your education. That's something I learned the hard way. Um, but if you always consistently make some time for yourself, you won't burn out and your motivation will continue. My thing was when I, my first semester, when 
one thing went hard for me. I kind of lost motivation just because I let my negativity affect me. Uh, but I was able to jump back. The thing is, you just have to constantly remind yourself not to compare yourself with other people because that's what we like to do, us pre-meds, right? It's always, it's always about, oh my gosh, am I performing as, as well as that other person? Or why is that person doing better than me? And it's okay that you feel that way, but just remind yourself, it, it's, a, it's going to be constant and it's going to have to be conscious. So knowing that this is your own journey, at the end of the day, everyone's going to be a doctor, right? Or in medical school, <laughs> everyone's going to be a doctor not, you know, you just have to remind yourself you already got in. And then even, even before that, if you want to be a doctor, no matter what happens, whatever setbacks you have, you are going to be a doctor. I promise you, because if that's what you want, it's going to happen. Nothing will get in your way. So it's just a constant reminder to motivate yourself. And as long as you have that in the back of your head and you stay calm, you will have that motivation. And I just wanted to mention, I think I, we skipped someone's question by accident. Someone was asking if we thought about other specialties. I wanted to be a general physician before, but I chose podiatry because, because uh, like I said, a gen, I could be a general physician of the foot and ankle, but also it's a specialty and I learn everything and anything to do with the foot and ankle. And I really liked that being an expert about it. Uh, maybe, maybe I should answer that too. Um, or other medical special. Yeah, I, I was considering orthopedics. Um, that, that's because of my history. My history is just long story short, I've had five foot surgeries and that was spanning from my high school, my junior year of high school to all the way to my sophomore year of college. And it was tough. It was real tough, but all of those surgeries were done by orthopedic surgeons. So you could imagine that I was exposed at a young age to orthopedics and looking up to them and thinking, oh, this is definitely something I want to do, something I strive to be. Um, but I also realized that I wish that nobody would go through what I went through and I wish I did more of conservative treatment and I wish I didn't jump the gun on surgery because that is a very drastic measure to do and after shadowing a few podiatrists seeing what I've listed before about their work-life balance personal relationships and doing conservative care treatment I thought those were all the things that related to me and what I morally stood for because I know there's a lot of doctors who like to jump the gun on surgery and surgery is the answer, but I personally love podiatry in the sense that you want to do the conservative treatment. You strive for that because yes, the patient will not, will, will complain and be like, Hey, surgery, like we want surgery, but so, seriously, like you will see positive results even faster and better with conservative treatment. And that's what I want to, I want to educate patients about that. And that's why podiatry is a suitable field for me because it allows me to have that platform to voice my concerns to patients through this field. So this is my reason why I joined this field and I love doing what I'm doing today. Okay, we need to go quickly because there's a lot of questions we're taking too sorry. long. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. I'm so sorry, you guys, we get so passionate. <laughs> That's okay. All right. We'll go to the next question. Um, okay. How has COVID-19 affected your classes and rotations? Yeah, so actually it's, uh, it's going not too terribly as far as classes go because our professors immediately jumped on it and they were able to navigate <clears throat> doing classes online. Some professors do have a difficult time with it, but otherwise we've, we've been able to do um, something called, uh, we use Respondus, which is the lockdown browser when we take exams and we kind of set our phones on a stand. So our professors are watching us, making sure no one's cheating. So those uh, classes are going well so far. 
the we've had to make some adjustments and as far as clinics that's the only downside because we don't have uh, we we aren't always allowed to go into clinic because they're not always open for students and sometimes sometimes patients might not like to have if we do have clinics sometimes patients a few times patients didn't want students in the room with the doctors uh, but other than that it's not terrible it's not terrible <laughs> Um, so uh, just moving on, I'll, I'll start reading the questions. Thank you for whoever has been reading the questions. Um, uh, why are diabetics treated more frequently in the podiatric field? Um, so one of the, it, for chronic diabetics, a lot of the people we see in our, in our clinic or in just this field in general, like we like, we see long-term chronic diabetic patients who've had diabetes for 10 plus years. And one of the main symptoms they develop is neuropathy, which is loss in sensation of uh, just, just loss of sensation, right? So uh, we like to call it the stocking glove effect where they actually start to lose sensation in their peripherals or their, lower, their extremities, such as your uh, feet and your hands. And so you can imagine why, like if, they, if somebody loses sensation on their feet and let's say they step on a piece of glass uh, and they don't notice it, right? They don't feel it, it's under their foot, they don't see it, that area could get infected and possibly that infection could get, they could get a bone infection. And this can lead to spread through your bloodstream and lead to sepsis and they could get an amputation or they could possibly die. And so it's, it's very vital for us to do uh, daily foot care checkups on these types of patients because, again, some of them don't even notice 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 these these things. And as well as diabetics do have a problem with uh, vascular flow sometimes. Uh, their blood vessels can calcify, which is one of another is another symptoms of chronic diabetics, and that can impede blood flow to again their extremities. And they could have um, loss of blood flow to let's say a toe. And if you have loss of blood flow, that could lead to ischemic issues. That's an ischemic issue, which could lead to breakdown of tissue, yada, yada, yada. I'm doing a science, science lecture here. But essentially, that's very bad. It can, again, lead to uh, necrotic tissue, bacteria living there, and another infection. So these are really important things that we need to make sure. And then we can refer, to, refer them to, let's say, vascular, because again, that's one of the other specialties, other medical professionals that we work with hand in hand as well. And they could possibly get like a bypass to help with those, um, those ischemic vessels or those occluded vessels in their extremities. And a quick edit, we don't necessarily see these patients on a daily basis, but more on a, depends. It, a lot of things <laughs> depend on the patient's insurance and whatnot. Um, okay, and so, Thank you, Yona. That was actually a great explanation. If you guys have questions about that, um, I think he explained it pretty well. Uh, what program did you use to study for the MCAT or which ones do you recommend? I personally use Kaplan. Okay, so a huge, huge thing about the MCAT is it's not about which program you use. It's not about what book you use. It's about you just learning the material. That's it. You learning the material and you practicing enough that you do well. Uh, that I didn't understand. <laughs> excuse me, back when I was studying for the MCAT, and I wish I did, because I was trying to search for the best thing, but it's it's all on you really to understand the material and uh, take enough practice exams. If you have anything to add, Yona. Yeah, I used the Kaplan material and I thought that was pretty well done with all the books, the seven book set or eight book set, I don't really remember. Um, I didn't use the online course for that. I know that's an additional fee, but like Dick just said before, there is no magic formula for whatever books or resources out there that people swear by, because in, in my opinion, the best way to study for the MCAT is again, giving yourself the allotted time for you to manage, uh, to successfully learn as much information as possible um, with whatever time you're giving yourself as well as uh, I would recommend you guys to focus on your college classes, your prerequisite classes, your science classes, because that in itself 
is your way of studying for the MCAT. You're preparing for this big exam at the end of your third year or fourth year or whatever year you're taking it in. So make sure you take good notes in those classes. Make sure you're really learning those classes because I know for myself when I took the MCAT, there was a lot of material that I didn't study off the Kaplan book that was on the MCAT. And, but however, I, I had some recall of what I learned previously in my physics class. And so just understanding that you, if you try really hard, if you try really hard to understand the material in your college courses before jumping into the Kaplan books or whatever resource you're using, this could benefit you in the long run. So just keep that in mind. The next question is, were there any clinic, uh, clinical experiences or extracurriculars that you did in undergrad that helped prepare you for medical school? So in general, any, any experiences with patients will help you, guaranteed. Uh, I worked with Alzheimer's patients. That was one of the things I did. Uh, I learned a lot about bedside manner and it's not, it's not even, it's not even like a conscious learning experience. You just gain that knowledge over time. It start, you just, you just learn from doing it so much, I guess. So I learned a lot through that. I also did a mobile health clinic. So again, I checked, I, I yeah, I, I did a lot of kind of mini checkups on patients and that helped me as well as um, what, what else? Oh yeah. And I was a mental health worker. So that was, that was my job. Actually. I had, I had just a year job, uh, mostly to get more experience in a field that I liked during my gap years. And I really like mental health. So that helped me get familiar with medications. <clears throat> Cause a lot of, a lot of my patients had comorbidities, which means just different conditions that they're dealing with, not just for their mental health, but also physical issues and so I learned a lot through that but really you could do anything that's with a patient and you'll gain a lot of experience like scribing a lot of a lot of people scribe and that could help you learn how to take notes right so yeah you have anything to add Nina? Um, I think also just for me personally I thought research was really helpful and just in the sense that I was when you were taking when I was taking college courses, I was taking a lot of college or a lot of science classes and while I was doing my research. So I was developing this skill of time management and you're going to hear that word be thrown around in medical school. You need to have good time management skills. And so I was developing that in college and I, I I'm not like the best at time management skills. I'm no expert in it, but just having some sort of understanding of how your schedule works and how to schedule your week and what priorities you need to prioritize um, is really beneficial and will honestly make you a very successful student in medical school. So just having just research plus classes going on allowed me to develop that skill. Okay, Yona, so for the next questions, I think one of us will answer instead of both of us. So it was mentioned that you need personal interviews. How do you get them? Or were you referring to interviews for podiatry school? So we were just, we were, we were talking about interviews for podiatry school. I, I'm sorry that we we're answering this so late, but it was about interviews for podiatry school. Um, how different are medical school interviews from normal job or internship interviews? Yona, you can answer that. Um, in normal job, I mean, so. I should answer that, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I'll answer, okay. <laughs> I realized, okay, so medical school interviews for, for us, for podiatry, as far as I know, I didn't interview at every school, but we don't have MMIs, but MMIs are very much different than normal job or inter internship interviews, depending on what job we're talking about. Um, it, I know there are a lot of tech companies that are starting to do, it kind of sounds like MMIs to me. My dad was explaining it to me, and uh, but MMIs are kind of like a a situation like you walk into a room and it's some situation and you have to show how you would react to that situation so that's how it would differ somewhat or be similar but as far as medical school interviews they're trying to 
I, honestly, you could think of it as a very similar thing to normal job internship interviews. In fact, it might behoove you to think of it like that as well, because you, you're just trying to show your personality and how they would benefit from accepting you, how their school would do better, how medicine would benefit having you. Um, yeah. Okay. Was organic chemistry difficult for you? What tips do you have to survive it and do well? Uh, okay. Should I answer that, Yona? Uh, okay so yeah, yeah. okay so ochem i i actually um so ochem was really tough it was really tough my i don't know if this would be doable for you but for all of you but i would recommend reading the book that they gave you I know it sounds awful but um not exactly reading as in trying to take it apart and every single word or something but what i mean by that is try to skim through the chapter that you're going to go over the next day. Uh, Pre-reading really helped with OCHEM. So once I started doing that, it, things made a little more sense because I would pre-read the day before. I would kind of preview what was going to be a, on the, in the lecture. And then I would take notes on what I really didn't, uh, not take notes, sorry. I would, uh, I would ask, I would write down my questions that I wanted to ask my professor the next day. The next day, our professor would teach me, teach us the material. And because I already knew what I would have difficulties understanding, I would ask that I would stay behind class and figure all of that out. And OCHEM is like another language, right? So you want to teach yourself from the foundation. You have to have a really good foundation to whatever your professor is teaching you. That's why I say to read as well. Uh, and do a lot of practice questions and do it early on, okay? That's the one class that I'd recommend. You stay on top of that. You do the homework, whether or not you're assigned the homework, do the homework out of the textbook. And whatever you have questions with, say, uh, yeah, even if you're not assigned, go to class and ask your professor, okay? That's the one, <laughs> the one way you'll really understand these things. Okay, hey, Yona, how did you spend your breaks during undergrad versus medical school? Um, I didn't really spend them too differently just because, uh, I mean, the areas are different. I, I, I went to Riverside and SoCal and now I'm in NorCal. So the breaks are in terms of environment and what I'm doing, it's a little bit different. But um, just overall, I, again, a lot of my breaks actually in college consisted of me going to the gym. Uh, I found that to be my happy place because our gym was one of the nicest things in our camp on our campus. So I just invite a lot of my friends and we'll just hang out at the gym. And that was just our go-to place, our hangout place where we just play racquetball most of the day and just play basketball. So that was one of, that was my way of spending my breaks mainly in um, undergrad. And now in med school, I find myself going on peaceful walks through like different parks around my area. And I think maybe that mainly that's due to me uh, just not having a gym open, unfortunately. And also uh, just because I just need to like be one with nature now because I, I, I sit in a room all day and I barely get enough sunlight through my room. So I just want to find some ways to get exposure to the natural elements once in a while yeah really it's not it's there's no difference we you, you could spend it the exact same way that you did it in undergrad it's just because of covid we're going on walks but otherwise same same thing go eat out with friends we'd go dance with friends it's whatever you make of it um did any of you ever take a gap year i took about two years, two or three years, but it wasn't intentional. I thought I was going to another medical school and then I ended up stopping. Uh, I ended up kind of, so a long, long story, but lots of stuff happened in between. So um, I was in a post -bac program. I was a mental health worker. I retook the MCAT. Um, and then I was going to go to a medical school in the Caribbean and then I chickened out and so that's why a lot a lot had happened in between and that's why I took all those gap years I just had intended for one gap year but 
don't don't ever think that timing is an issue. If there's things you want to do in between now and medical school, do it, do it now. Uh, now it's becoming more common for people to start a lot later in their lives. Um, it's just about when you feel ready. Yeah, and just um, another thing with that is, unless if you have, like for me, I took a gap year because I had shoulder surgery. So I had to take a gap year. Um, but if you, if you're not having surgery or there's no emergency going on that you have to take a gap year, you should probably do something during your gap year, something that could benefit you, your application, something that can make you stand out. And personally, I, I could have done more during my gap year, but I, again, I was recovering from shoulder surgery. But if you want to do research, do research, get published, be first author of something. That's pretty incredible. That makes you look good that you were learning something during that time. And then you can carry that on to your medical school career. So do something to your, your gap year. Don't just make it so that, oh, I need a break from college. I just need a rest. All those four years of college were brutal. And I'm just going to take a one-year break. Trust me, a one-year break is so long that you're going to find yourself being so bored at certain points unless you're traveling the world. Um, so do something. But even, even after that, that being said, yeah, yeah, you, you can, you can still, can still enjoy that year without, uh, with working or with whatever you're doing for your application. Um, and don't do something just because you think you have to, because you're pre-med do it because you really want to. My brother, when he was a pre-med, he's in medical school now, but what he had done was he, he was in a company that had nothing to really do with what pre-meds normally do. And he tried to, he had uh, created an app. And so it's just whatever you feel like doing, but make sure, like Yona said, you, you probably want to show that you are doing something so that um, you have more to add to bolster your application. And yeah, now we've spoken too much. So thank you for all of your questions and thank you for inviting us, Medvacate. Yeah, thank you so much, Deisha and Yona, for taking time out of your days to host one of our events. Uh, your presentation and like answering the questions was truly inspiring. And I think many of us has, have learned a lot about the field of podiatry. So again, thank you so much. Of course. And again, thank you for hosting us again. And if you guys have any questions, feel free to message us on our Instagram because we love answering all your questions. We do appreciate you guys taking some time out of your day to listen to us. And again, hopefully all of you are staying safe out there and I hope you guys are having a great day as well and a good weekend.